spiritual matters and that won't do it for you. And that man throws his hands up and he says, he said, what am I supposed to help you with? I don't have anything to help you. It's a pitiful thing when the church gets to a place where we don't have help for people. People should be coming to the church house to find answers rather than us sending them away from the church to look for answers. But God was getting ready to do uh, an amazing thing here and the prophet Elijah, be, uh, Elisha begins to tell him something. He says in 2 Kings chapter 7 and verse 1, it says, Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. That's always the answer. People have questions. They don't know what to do. The king would say, Man, how can I help you out of, the, out of the barn floor, out of the wine press? I don't have anything to help you with. And a man of God steps out. He doesn't say, Well, I think. He said, Let me tell you the word of the Lord. When people come and need help, we don't have to come up with, with our own answers. It don't have to come by our own intellect. All we got to do is say, what does the Word of God say? And Elisha said, I want you to hear the Word of the Lord. He said, thus saith the Lord tomorrow about this time uh, shall a measure of fine flour be showed for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. He was saying, you're paying this high price for stuff. 24 hours from now, it's going to be sold for nothing. And he said, then a, a Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be. And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shall not eat thereof. And it says that there were four leprous men at the entering end of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? Why sit here? Four beggars sitting there that, that had nothing to lose said, Why sit here and die? He said, if we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. If we sit here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots, and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried uh, then silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. Then they said one to another, We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the, tell the king's household. I want to preach on that just for a few minutes tonight when it says why I sit here until we die. You know, a lot of people know they need things fixed up in their life. They know that there's things that, that needs to be rectified, but they sit there. They think somehow that, that time will cure the problem. They'll think, they'll think, well, maybe tomorrow or next week, some other time will be better. We think the situations will get better. We have emptiness. When a sinner is out there that, that is separated from Christ, he has an emptiness inside of his life, and he thinks that somehow something is going to, Feel that emptiness in his life. That hole that is in his life, he thinks, can be filled with something. But the whole time, the answer is looking them right in the face. Like we preached the other day about uh, what is truth and what shall we do with Jesus, which is called Christ. We know the answer to those questions. We know that truth is found in the person of Jesus. We know that, that we have to accept him, that we have to fall down and call him Lord and repent of our sins. That's the answer. But a lot of people never... Never do anything about it. It's one thing, like I was preaching the other day, about having head knowledge about this, but it's another thing to do something about it. And these men are sitting here in a hopeless situation. They don't know where else to go. They're, they're beggars. So if, if everybody else is, is scraping for food and a beggar is out there, the beggar has nothing. A beggar can only live on what somebody else is giving him, but when a, when a donkey's head is sold for an astronomical amount and they're going around and gathering up dove's dung to eat it, you can bet that, that beggar had, those beggars had nothing at all to eat. So they come up in their mind and they think, all right, in, in the city we'll probably die. If we sit here, we're going to die. If we go to the Syrians, we may die, but why sit here and die? That's the thing about it. The devil may paint all these pictures in your mind. Well, what if... 
What if you go and, and, and people don't accept you? What if you go and you pray and you don't feel anything? What about if you go and you fail? What about a million scenarios plays out in our mind? Well, what if, what if you pray for the Holy Ghost and He won't fill you? What about it? Why sit there and die though? If you keep going the way you're going right now, you're going to die. If you keep going, if you keep, if you keep uh, living the way you're going, it's going to kill you anyhow. So why don't you do something about it? And when you look at this situation, you see a famine has came into that, that land. What are the characteristics of that famine? It's a, it's a terrible situation. Those people are starving to death. And all, they, all they're doing is the enemy is out there waiting them out. See, that's all the devil's got to do with you. His favorite word is tomorrow. You can get saved. You can fix this. You can, you can uh, fix the problems between a brother or sister. Or you can, you can really get down and get your nose to the grindstone. You can, you can start praying, reading the Bible. You can start doing what you need to do. But don't start today. Do it tomorrow. All the devil is trying to do is wait you out. Uh, it's a waiting game. And if he can wait you out long enough, you'll go to hell. There's more people are in hell right now because of their pride and because they, they had this uh, the wrong sense of time. They thought, I've got all the time in the world and not to realize that there is no guarantee of tomorrow. The Bible says, for what is your life? What is your life? It is a vapor. Don't say you'll go tomorrow, you'll go to such a city, you'll buy and sell, you'll make, you'll make gain. Don't, don't plan for tomorrow, plan for today. Today is the day of salvation. And all these, all these Syrians was doing is thinking, man, they're killing themselves. Just wait them out. We don't, have to, we don't have to throw a spear at one of them. We don't have to try to breach those walls. All we've got to do is just wait them out, and they'll die anyhow. That's what the devil has done with the church house. The devil has came in and shut down churches, made it to where people are not having parking lot services or inside services. All he's doing is just waiting them out and you'll see one church after another fold up and quit. One church after another. One person after another that backslides on God because the enemy has just came around them, waiting them out, thinking if I can keep them long enough off their knees, out of the church house, and out of the Word of God, it'll kill them. They'll starve to death sitting right there. People say, well, you know, you, you don't have to go to church to be saved. But the Bible tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. You know what my job and these jobs as, as preachers are and these ministers that saying, you know what our job to do is to feed the sheep. When Jesus looked at Peter, he said, Do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Then you feed them. That is our job, is to feed the sheep. It is your job. It is all of our job to come to God's house because we are the sheep uh, under that great shepherd and we have to come and we have to eat. But all the devil is doing is just saying, No, you don't have to do it now. Just wait them out, besieging us told us that we can't go to church, told us that we'll be persecuted. Well, what about if you get the virus? Well, what, what if you do? Well, maybe you will. I'm not going to say nothing's ever going to happen to you, but you can't sit there. If you keep sitting there, you're going to die. If you keep sitting there in the shape you're in, you're going to backslide on God to the unregenerate person out there who feels the conviction of God. All you've got to do is turn that away. Just keep turning it away every day. And one of these days, they won't be a tomorrow. They won't be another time. Today is the day of salvation. The Bible says they will come a famine in the last days. It would, in Amos, he said, it's not a famine of bread and water, but it's hearing the word of the Lord. And you say, man, we're in a country that, that uh, there are preachers on every corner. We've got 350,000 pastors in America. But that doesn't mean the word of the Lord is being heard. They may be people out there, and they are good people out there that, that are feeding good things. There are a lot of them that's feeding poison to the flock. But they're a word of the Lord that is still being preached. But it didn't say there'll be a lack of preaching. It said there'll be a lack of hearing the word of the Lord. You can sit here in this parking lot tonight and not eat anything. You can sit right here, let it go in one ear, out the other. Let these anointed songs go in one ear, out the other, not respond. Look at your clock and try to figure out when are we going to get out of here. And you'll starve to death sitting right in the church house. See, it's that famine that's came in is, and that is a perfect representation of what is happening here. There are famine in that land. So what, what happens with the famine? The Bible says that, that it got to the point where a donkey's head was sold for so much and a fourth part of a, 
a calf of dove's dung was sold for so much. You say, what's that mean? That means that they was eating what they shouldn't be eating. Because there was a lack of hearing the word of the Lord, because of that, then people will eat what is not even the proper, and what is not even proper teaching. Just because somebody has a degree or somebody stands and, and packs a Bible under their arm, that doesn't mean that they're feeding anything. Just because somebody goes to church, that don't make it right. And those people, rather than eating something good, rather than rise up like the lepers and think, man, why sit here and die? Instead, they're raking around trying to find a little something to bring nutrition to them, and they're starving to death. It's the same thing that people are doing in the churches. Rather than go somewhere where they can get some help, rather where they can go somewhere and hear the word of the Lord, instead, they're digging around trying to find some something little, something just to keep them afloat. But you can't keep going that way. You can't keep going without solid doctrine. That milk will only work for so long. When you became a, a man, as you grow and mature as a, as a Christian, you become spiritually mature, that milk of the Word is going to have to turn into the meat somewhere. We can preach regeneration and we can preach being born again and, and baptism. We can preach that, but that's the milk. You've got to get deeper than that. You've got to get into the meat of the Word of God. And those people were starving to death because they, they wouldn't rise up. All the lepers had to do is say, why sit here and die? Why sit in the shape we're in? If we go into the city, we might die. If we go to church, we might we might catch a virus. If we, if we do this or we do that. But the point is, you can't sit there and be in active about it the Bible says it got to this terrible spot when the king just the king throwed his hands up because a woman came to him and said I want to I want you to deal with this other woman but what happened well we made a deal the deal was that my little baby we just decided we would uh, kill it and we'd boil it and we'd eat it and then she was supposed to get me hers the next day and now she's hit her son and the king throws his hands up and thinks, my goodness, what has this become? Cannibalism had came into, into Samaria and they was, they was eating their own children. You say, what a pitiful thing. Well, I mean, they, they killed a few in Samaria. We've murdered over a million in every year since 1973. We're murdering our own. Not only that, we're not teaching them, not taking them to the church house and it's killing them spiritually. And then we, we're sitting here and, and it's, I mean, it's this terrible situation and the Bible tells us that if we're not careful, we'll do the same thing in the church house. It says you bite and devour one another. You turn around and, and, and uh, gnash on one another rather than realize the enemy is not inside. The enemy's out there. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to stand up. We're supposed to make a stand. The Bible says beat your plowshares in the swords. Beat your pruning hooks in the spears. Let the weak stand up and say I am strong. What they should have been doing rather than turning on their self in Samaria, they should have been getting some swords up and thinking, man, we might get killed if we go out there, but why not let's try something? See, they lost, they lost their confidence in God. And whenever uh, the prophet tells them in 24 hours from now, you're going to see flair sold for so much. You're going to see, you're going to see bushels of, of food sold for just a few shekels. They said if God were to open up the windows of heaven, how in the world could that be? They lost their confidence. See, a lot of people, they, they've starved for so long. They've been without, without a word for so long. They've, they've, bite, they've bitten and devoured one another for so long. They've sat in that, in that place where they've lost all hope to the point comes when somebody comes and gives them a word, they can't believe it. See what we do? We preach. Man, if you can feel the conviction of God, if you can feel God dealing with that heart, if you can feel Him drawing you to an old-fashioned altar of prayer, He'll save you. And there people will say, man, you, it, it can't be that easy. I'm telling you that it's that easy. You are saved by faith. You are saved by grace through faith and that not of yourself. It's a gift of God. That man said, if, if, if God opened up the windows of heaven, and we couldn't see something like that. He lost his word. A lot of people lose their word. God has told them we're a church that believes in prophecy. I've had people prophesy to me and it come to pass just like you wrote it down. It's come to pass. 
But what will happen is people will give us a word and we believe it when they say it. But after a while, the devil begins to steal that word out of our heart. And we begin to doubt. Well, can God actually do that? Can God do this? My goodness, he took the Red Sea one time and parted it and let six million or three million people walk over on dry ground. He took a little shepherd boy and killed the greatest warrior that ever lived. He delivered them out of the lion's den and out of the fiery furnace. He has stretched way below the bottom and pulled me out. And a whole bunch in this parking lot pulled us out of the lowest hell. If God can do that for one, He can do it for another. If God can save you, He can fill you with the Holy Ghost. If He can fill you with the Holy Ghost, the manifestations of the Spirit can work through your life. Or you can sit back and think, I'm done for. I throw it in the towel. Let's Dutch dig around. Try to find a, a donkey's head somewhere. Or you can stand up and say, you know what? I'm tired of sitting here and dying. I'm tired of, oh God. I'm tired of sitting in that church pew every night. I've grown to the thing. It's got attached to me. I'm tired of sitting there. I'm tired of watching other people stand up and praise the Lord. I'm tired of seeing people, everybody else get in. Why am I going to sit here if he's no respect for a person? If he'll do it for one, surely he'll do it for me. But you got to do something about it. He will never get the Holy Ghost because they never learned how to worship. They go to the altar. Oh, Lord, help me. Fill me with the Holy Ghost. Then the Holy Ghost tries to move on them, and they, they, they shut him off. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know what you need to do? You need to quit sitting there and dying. Get up. Raise your hand toward heaven. Begin to praise him. Worship him in spirit and in truth, and he'll fill you. Well, I don't know if that's for me. <laughs> Which of us have never had to face that? Well, it must not be for me. For one year, you hear me, for one year, the devil come down to me every night, every time I bowed my knees and said, that's not for you. It was like saying, if God were to open up the windows of heaven, how could this thing be? But one day a man of God said, I'll tell you what, in 24 hours, you're going to see it. In 24 hours from right now, somewhere you've got to get to the point to think, all right, I'm tired of the status quo. I'm tired of keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Why sit here and die? Why not get up and do something about it? Why don't when I feel the Spirit of God, why don't you do something about it? <laughs> Oh, I feel good right now. Boy, I wish we was inside right now. <laughs> sit there that night, Lord told me, said, now run. No, I'd rather sit here and die. I'd rather sit here and do it my way. Got down to pray and prayed and prayed and prayed, and the Lord spoke to me. He said, son, you lack one thing. Well, what is that thing? What do you think it is? Told you to run, you won't run. You're just going to sit here and die. You're just going to keep sitting there disobeying God. God's going to tell you what to do. You're going to reason that out in your mind. Well, what's everybody think about it? You see that sign up there? It says Pentecostal church. This ain't some dead liturgical church. This is the church that believes in the power and the manifestation of the Spirit of God. We believe in obeying God. The Bible said He'd give the Holy Ghost to them that obeys Him. And we sit there and we reason it out. Well, if somebody else will do it. taste of it. That's what he told him. That Lord on whom the king leaned, he said, if God were to open up the windows of heaven, how could this thing be? And that man of God said, let me tell you something. 24 hours from right now, you're going to see it, but you're not going to taste it. 24 hours from now, you're going to watch as a miracle of God happens and you're going to sit there and, and what happened to him is the people stomped him to death trying to get to the good stuff and it killed him sitting there because he doubted that it was for him. He doubted that God could do that. And so he said, you'll see it, but you won't taste of it. You say, what's that got to do with it? I'll tell you exactly what it's got to do with it. God has spoke to you, told you to sing a song, and you didn't sing it, and somebody else sung it for you. God's told you to run around the church, and you didn't do it, and somebody else ran. God told you to testify, and you wouldn't do it, so somebody else testified your testimony. God told you, He told you, and He told you. And instead, you're saying, well, how can this be? I don't know what I'm supposed to do. God, if that's really you, let me see 14 different signs and have 10 prophets tell me what to do. And you sit there and you've been dying for years because you won't get up and I won't get up and obey God and do what God's telling me.
telling me to do. But if we'll do what he tells us to do, we can see the very windows of heaven open up and a blessing of God poured out. Amen. So naturally, naturally, you know, they're not all this. They blame the man of God. Oh, it's nobody else's fault. It's not the fact that the king is too weak need to fight the enemy. It's not the problem that, that there are people killing their babies and eating them. It's not the problem that people have lost their backbone to fight, so who to blame? Always the same thing. It's always blame the man of God. The church will get blamed for the coronavirus. It will get blamed for everything that ever happens. Not to, this, this country has turned its back on God. We've killed over a million babies every year since 1973. Over 60 million of them have been killed. We've allowed homosexuality to come in. Homosexual marriages and homosexuals to stand behind the pulpits of the, of the churches of America. We've allowed every ungodly thing. We don't know the difference between a boy and a girl. We don't know anything. We've lost our mind. And yet when God brings judgment to a place the first one they want to point at is they want to point at the church house. I expected more horn beefs than that. But you remember this. You remember when they marched in the streets of America all over, all over the United States last year, nobody wore a mask and nobody dared say one word about it. But when we come to the church and we, and we fellowship with each other, first thing they was going to do is try to come in and write our license plate number. Why? Because the church is always going to get the black eye. The church is going to get blamed. There are going to be people running their mouth. You hear me right now if you're watching this. Uh, give me some mad faces. You're going to run your mouth because there was a couple people that got the virus. Who's to say? Uh, uh, you never said anything that the fact that we saw during the revival, we saw people get saved pulled out of the flames of hell, won't have to go to hell one day. No, strangely quiet over that, but want to blame us because somebody got sick. <laughs> what are they doing? They're sitting there in the city and they're not doing anything about it. It's the same thing I can say right now. We look at the shape we're in and we're not doing anything about it. People say, well, I don't get anything out of church. Well, you know, I just ain't doing anything for me. Well, what are you putting into it? Put it like that. I've had the same people that don't show up, uh, don't show up any. Then they'll turn around and say, well, I just don't get anything out of it. Well, you ain't turned a tap in, in years. You ain't done anything. You ain't praised the Lord. You ain't testified. You ain't, you ain't backed the altar rails. You ain't prayed at the altar. You ain't done anything. And then you want to blame the church for your own inadequacy. It's its old as time itself. Eve said, that serpent. Adam said, that woman. It's always the thing, the thing to blame somebody else. But i tell you where we're at. i tell you where I'm at tonight. The reason I'm in the shape that I'm in is not because anybody else. It's because I'm as close to God as I choose to be. The same thing with you. You're as close to God as you choose to be. Let's don't blame a man of God. Let's don't blame the church. Let's don't blame God. Let's blame ourselves because we've not rose up and took back what the enemies took from us. I'm, I'm tired of being besieged by the enemy. I'm tired of the devil camping around the church house and trying to strike fear in God's people. Right. Those lepers said, you know what? I'm tired of sitting here. I mean, we're sitting around, and you I've sat with you four right now. I've sat with you, us four and sat around for years, and, and I'm tired of sitting here. We're about to starve to death, man. Man, we're, you can see the ever rib. You can count every rib we got. Well, what are we going to do about it? I don't know, but we're not going to keep sitting here. I'm going to get up and do something about it. Well, if we go into Samaria, man, don't go in there. That, that place is dead. That's what a lot of people do. They're out there and they're starving to death spiritually. They're, they know they need something. And rather than go somewhere where they can get some help, they go to a place that's got death in it. Just because they're a crossover, just because they're a steeple or a stained glass window in a place doesn't make it a house of God. They said, no, we're not going into Samaria. There ain't no help there. Well, what about out there? Those enemies, they, they'll kill us. Well, maybe they will. But we got to do something. We can't keep sitting here. When God begins to show you something, you've got to do something about it. And the Bible says that there was a great miracle work that day. Because what happened is they stood up and thought, we're going to go to the enemy's camp. They never dreamed what was about to happen. But as those four lepers began to march toward that, toward that Syrian camp, God began to move. 
And the Bible says that it sounded like a mighty host. You say, man, that was just four lepers. They probably wasn't making much noise walking across that sandy ground. God can take something little and make something big out of it. And that whole ground began to shake and they lose their mind. They're thinking, man, uh, we know the Hittites and the Egyptians are coming after us. Let's get out of here. And they run, get on their horses and ride off and leave everything. Now see, it worked out for, the, for the, those in Samaria. But, but the similar situation plays it, itself out to us too. Because sometimes we are those Syrians. Sometimes our, own, our, our biggest enemy is our imagination. If they had just waited, what they would have saw would have been four, four skinny lepers walking up about to die. And if they would just stayed for a little bit, they would have saw that it was just that it was just God. I mean, God was doing it, but they but it was just four men. But they let their imagination go wild. Same thing that we do sometimes. We let our imagination run wild. We think, well, what about this? What about that? And we make mountains out of molehills. We make situations that are not even, not even big and we make them into something big. And we do the same thing. So my, that was just one point I wanted to make there is that, is that, we, that we do that. But, but let's go back. These are, these are beggars. A beggar in those days had no other means of support. That meant that if they got anything, somebody had to give it to them. And when Jesus stood up and delivered His great uh, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, when He opens his mouth, sits down and opens his mouth and began to teach. And he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit literally translates as the beggars in spirit. Blessed are the beggars in spirit. What's he talking about? He's talking about somebody that realizes that they in their self cannot get anything. I know that. You know that. You need to know that. You cannot in yourself produce anything. It takes God to produce that. We are beggars in the fact that anything that we get, I never saved me, I can't save you. I never filled me with the Holy Ghost, and I can't fill you with the Holy Ghost. But when we come to that point where we realize, man, we need we, everything that we get, we got to get it from God, and we put our trust and our confidence in God, it'll make us do something different. It'll make us rise up. It'll make us realize, why are we going to sit here and die? If you will affirm the fact that it's that God is not a respecter of person. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Holy Ghost is uh, Acts chapter 2 verse 39. For the promise is unto you and your children, them that are far off, even as many as the Lord thy God shall call. <laughs> scripture after scripture after scripture that we could give you to say that, that these are for you. Then you realize that, that where you're at, it's not doing it for you. Now what's left? Now you can sit there and die or you can rise up and do something about it. When God begins to deal with you and God is dealing with people, he, I felt Him dealing right now during this, during this service about the Holy Ghost. You know that that's exactly right. We've sat there for too long. We've sat back and we've quenched the Spirit when the Bible tells us very clearly not to. We have denied the Holy Ghost access to our life and then we're sitting there and and the devil is, is having a heyday with us. What are we going to do about it? You can't do a thing about the past. You, you cannot do one thing about yesterday. But you can do something from here on out. You can get to that place like the beggars and say, Why are we just going to sit here and die? Why keep sitting in this condition? If you're lost tonight, why keep going the way you're going? The drugs won't do it. The alcohol won't do it. And then the devil will tell you, Well, you can't be delivered. They are people sitting in this parking lot right now that have been delivered from the bondage of drugs. They've been delivered from the bondage of alcohol. They've been delivered from the bondage of a, of a, a perverse lifestyle. They've been uh, delivered from every bondage out there. And the devil will say, you can't have it. Well, let me ask you something. Why, why are you going to sit there and die? You'll say, well, I may go and may not get any help. I know you will get help, but let's go with your argument. Well, I may go and the Lord may not deal with me. All right, but He ain't dealing with you where you're at. He's not going to save you and leave you in that hog pen. You've got to come to your senses and come out of that, pro uh, out of that hog pen 
like the prodigal son and think, man, I'm going to starve to death right here. That hog's eating better than I am. There's servants back in Father's house that's got more than I've got. I'm going to get up. I'm going to get out of this hog pen and I'm going to go at least try something. That's what I'm getting at. Why don't we try something different? If if getting down at that altar every night and, and, and afraid anybody's even going to hear you pray and that's not filled you with the Holy Ghost yet, why don't you try something different? Why don't when you feel that? Because it works. I've saw more people, just about every person that I've ever seen filled with the Holy Ghost, I've seen them go to that altar and they get down and pray. But then after a little while, they throw their inhibitions to the wind. They think, I don't care what anybody thinks about it. I'm tired of sitting here and molding over. I'm tired of sitting here and dying every night. I'm tired of getting defeated. I'm tired of walking out the church service, still not filled, still not have what God's got for me. And they stand up. Boy, when I see people start standing up and they start praising the Lord and hearing the little bit they don't even know where they're at they're worshiping somewhere but they're worshiping God they've entered into that spiritual realm and all of a sudden the power of God comes down into their soul what I'm saying man why sit there and die well somebody might talk about me <laughs> you're looking at one that's been run down more than anybody in this country has but that's all right that's all right. One of these days, I'm not worried about what they got to say. I'm worried about one day when I stand before the judge of this universe as he stands and says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. It'll all be worth it. The end will justify the means. You stand up and you praise God. You worship Him. You get to a place where you're instant obedient. He tells you to run. Oh, I know the devil say you can't do that. You're talking to the wrong one. I got the Holy Ghost running three laps around the church house. Yeah, I'm one of them. Yeah. I've seen people do some peculiar things, but I've seen the same ones walk out of a church with victory. I've seen them walk out with their belly full. <laughs> the Bible says those old Samaritans, or those, yeah, those Samaritans that day, those four lepers, they thought, man, why sit here and die? They started walking toward that enemy's camp. It didn't sound like a you know, like a mighty host to them. It sounded like three other lepers that stunk walking in with them. And they walk up to that enemy's camp, and there's an empty tent. Man, they got fried chicken on the on the table. Man, this is too good to be true, ain't it? We're going to starve anyhow. Well, they're probably waiting outside to kill you. Well, maybe, but I'll die with a full belly anyhow. And they sat down and eat them a big plate of chicken, and then there's a pie. They eat that and they look over and there's some gold and they start sticking it in their pockets. But man, this is too good to be true. They've got ten necklaces hanging around their neck. Their belly's pooched out where they ain't eating in a while. Man, they, they fill their belly full. And they walk into the next one and there's the same thing. There's a ribeye steak. Well, let's eat. Man, we may not eat tomorrow. Let's, let's try to eat some more. And they sit down and everywhere they go, there's stuff laying there. What I'm saying, they walked in. Their, their, their belly was grabbing their backbone. When they walked out, they had a full belly, a pocket full of gold, and they had all, and they had some good news. What I'm saying, people might laugh at you. They might mock at you. They might have counted you out a long time ago. But why sit there and die? Why don't you get up and do something about it? Why don't you at least get up and try God's way? You've tried it your way way too long. It ain't worked for you. But God can take that situation and He can make it all work for your benefit. And when they walk back in, here they come. Man, they've got some good news. I thought them was them lepers. I thought they'd starve to death. I I hadn't seen them out there in a little while. I thought they'd starve. They don't look starved to me. They look like they've been eating pretty good and they got a smile on their face. <laughs> Can you imagine being the Lord on whose, on whose uh, hand the king leaned that it said if God were to open up the very windows of heaven? That can't happen. Can you imagine what it was day when those, when those bars was pulled off of the gates of Samaria and four <laughs> lepers walk in? Man, they've got gold hanging off of them. They got pockets of silver and gold and their belly pooched out and they walk in and says, you know what? Right down there is exactly what we've been looking for. Quit eating that, that donkey's head you're eating. 
Quit eating that dove's dung. I know you're chasing that dove around, waiting for it to go to the bathroom. Quit getting after that. We got something that's good out there. We got something out there. Man, there, the table is spread out there. All you got to do is get up and go get what, you, what, what, what you've got. You say, well, I'm not worthy. What in the world do you think those lepers was? You think they was worthy? They was outcasts of society. They stunk. They had leprosy hanging all over them. It wasn't the fact they was worthy. It was the fact that it was a gift from God. But it was too good to keep it hid. That's how I feel. This, this is too good for me. I don't deserve anything. If I got what I deserved, I'd be thrown in the lowest hell tonight. But because of God's grace and because of God's mercy, He reached down and pulled me out of a pit, put me on a path, showed me all those things just like, just like those Samaritans who walked into that Syrian camp. You mean I can have that? Well, it's for you. Why don't you get it? You mean I can have the baptism of the Holy Ghost too? Well, it's for you. You mean I can have a gift of prophecy? Well, there it is. You mean the gifts of healing could work in my life? So I would give what I would give to be in that church house right now. I'm telling you, I feel God right now. And we've sat there so long and we've sat and died. We've died spiritually. We've sat and we've waited around and we've waited for this to come and that to come. And what God is saying, someday I'm waiting for somebody to get up and say, why sit here and die? Why sit here without the Holy Ghost? Why sit here without the gifts and the power of God? Why keep sitting in that condition? Come on, while they're cutting to get a song tonight. I say stand to your feet, but you can do that. You can get out and stand to your feet. I feel God right now. Do you believe God could baptize somebody in the Holy Ghost in this parking lot tonight? You don't think you can. You've got the wrong idea of God. God can heal somebody right down here in this parking lot tonight. God's dealing with people right here tonight. Dealing, I wish I could look you in the eye, but I know that. I know that God is dealing right here. We've sat there. I'm preaching to me. Man, I'm preaching to myself as much as anybody. Man, this is some good news. I've got pulled out of a pit. This is some good news for you. If God can save me, He can save you. If God can fill me with the Holy Ghost, anybody on, on planet Earth could be filled with the Holy Ghost and saved. If God could reach down and dig me out of that sign pit that I was in and, and can save me and you feel the same way, you out there that's been saved, if God could do that for you, can't He do it for anybody else? If He can baptize you in the Holy Ghost, oh, He can baptize them out here tonight. They're like that leper. I'm tired of sitting here. I'm tired of going to some dead church. I'm tired of going to some dead service. I'm tired of, tired of going to a church service and sitting there and letting the seat grow to my backside. I'm tired of sitting here. Let's get up and do something about it. Let's worship God. We're a Pentecostal church. Let's worship God. Let's worship Him in spirit and in truth. Let the Holy Ghost have His way. Let the power of God come down in a church service. And buddy, when the next time somebody sees us, they'll think, man, they look a little different. Those lepers walk back in. They looked a little different. Thus, some of them was wearing a fine suit of clothes. One of them had a suit on. One of them had his belly pooched out. Uh, had gold in his pockets. Man, there's something. Yeah, I'll tell you what it is. There's something out there. There's something out there you've been missing. There's something out there that will solve this famine in Samaria right now. There's something that can help you. There's something right here tonight. Not something, someone that is here tonight that can help you. That can help you right where you're at. So I ask you while they sing tonight. Listen, these altars are open. We got cushions right there. You can get underneath the shed. You can get right down beside these things. You say, well, you know. Listen, you get hungry enough, you wouldn't care. It wasn't a matter. When those, Samarit or when those Samaritan lepers got hungry enough, they wasn't worried about what anybody thought about it. They thought, I'm just going to go get some help. And they got their help. And what me and you've got to do is we've got to quit sitting there and active. Quit sitting there and dying. Quit sitting there and drying up. During the revival, the revival that we've been in, it's not had been in, we are in revival. Still seeing people saved and baptized and expecting people to just be filled with the Holy Ghost in a mighty way. We're in revival, but you can starve to death right in this revival. You can sit, if you don't do anything about it, it ain't going to do you a bit of good. You can sit down to the finest, the finest meal ever was. You can go to a buffet and starve to death if you won't eat. Well, it's here tonight. The answer to what you need is here tonight. God is here tonight. I can feel His presence. The heaven of heaven cannot, cannot contain Him. 
And he's right here tonight and he wants to save you. He wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost. He wants the power of God working in your life. What are you going to do about it? So come on. Come on. Step right out of those vehicles. Step down. Make your way down here. Make your way down to, to an old-fashioned altar of prayer. Begin to seek the face of God. I beg you, please. Please. If you're missing something, maybe you feel like those lepers and just feel like, man, it's, it's a bad situation. Oh, God can take that bad situation and in 24 hours, that can be a thing of the past. The problems you've got tonight by tomorrow morning could be a, could be a thing that's been, that is long gone. But you've got to do something about it. You've got to respond when the power of God, when the, when the good news comes, they had to do something about it. So we've got to, we've got to get our help tonight. We've got to rise up and we've got to get our help tonight. So I ask you, church, let's just gather right around Gather right around tonight. Yes. Once prayer tonight. Once prayer. I ask you out there, those out there that won't come and, and pray or don't want to come around, just bow your head where you are, please. Please. While we give this altar call, we need to pray for Sister Judy. But but while we're giving that right now, I ask you, please, bow your head right now while I sit there and die. Don't keep sitting like that. There's help for you. I believe there's help for this dear sister right here. I believe the windows of heaven are opening up right now. Same power of God that we can feel right now, that conviction of God, the same one that can, that can heal her, give her a divine healing right now. We believe in divine healing. And I believe God can do that right now. So come on, let's find a place to pray or let's back her in prayer right now.
So we know that he's blessing out here. So uh, again, we will we will uh, plan on being out here tomorrow night, uh, Wednesday, and then next Saturday and Sunday. And that should give it time for everything for you know everything to go past. So and then we'll try to get back in just as soon as we as soon as we can. But but I do I do enjoy it. I've, I've enjoyed myself tonight. So I hope everybody will everybody will come back tomorrow and invite somebody and uh, and let's be much in prayer. Let's be praying for the church and and just praying that. Praying that God would uh, bless, bless right out here. If somebody gets saved, or those on somebody on Facebook or YouTube would get saved. And so, all right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Then be dismissed, and we'll see you tomorrow. Gracious God, our heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, for this service tonight. We thank you for what we felt. God, we thank you for your presence, Lord, that's been here tonight. We thank you so much for that. Thank you for all these wonderful songs, Lord, how you anoint these singers, Lord, every night. God, all these all these songs, Lord, in this altar service tonight, God, we're just, we thank you for that. We ask you, Lord, that you would continue to bless this church, bless these parking lot services. God, bless the churches around. God, let the church rise up at this last hour, Lord, and realize, Lord, how, how serious this is, Lord, how important it is for us to, to assemble together and, Lord, to worship you, come together to help one another. God, we thank you and we ask you, Lord, that you would just bless each and every one, go with them, bring them back here safely. For we ask it all in Jesus' holy name. Amen.